So, yeah, I think you do a bit later, no? The time difference. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, so then before we start uh, with uh, the prayers, then maybe good idea to uh, generate crack motivation uh, for the coming up uh, sessions. Yeah, so maybe halfway through we have a short break. And we'll try to have uh, a good motivation in the sense we're going to discuss and talk about, uh, yeah, the kindness basically of sentient beings and, and how to generate uh, love and kindness and compassion in order to move yourself all the way up to the stage of a path of enlightenment. So for that purpose, uh, we're here and also we should try to generate correct motivation in that direction uh, to develop your mind all the way up to enlightenment uh, in order to help others to achieve the same. Yeah, so try to generate that kind of motivation for yourself. And then in front, imagine Sakyamuni Buddha surrounded by the masters of India, Tibet, and the other Buddhist traditions. And then surrounding yourself, uh, countless beings undergoing individual suffering and think it's our responsibility to do something for them. And for that purpose, I'm here in order to start leading them into the prayer. Yeah, so I take that into account and then we can recite the, the prayers together. To the founder and down transit and destroy the one gone beyond the full destroy the complete perfect full awakened way perfect in knowledge and the good conduct sagata know of the world supreme guide of human beings to be tamed teacher of gods and human beings to you the complete fully awakened one the down transit and destroy glorious conquer subdue from the sake can prostrate the golden scope of refuge to the founder down transit and destroy the one gone beyond the full destroy the complete perfect full awakened being perfect in knowledge and the good conduct Sagada know of the world, supreme guide of human beings to be attained. Teacher of gods, human beings, to you the complete, fully awakened one. Get down, transcend, and destroy the glorious conquer, subdue from the Sake clan, and prostrate in the Gopin's world refuge. To the founder, down, transcend, and destroy the one gone beyond, the full destroy. The complete, perfect, fully awakened being, perfect in knowledge and a good conduct. Sagata know of the world, supreme guide of human beings to be attained. Teacher of gods, human beings, to you the complete, fully awakened one. They don't transcend and destroy the glorious conquer, subdue from the sake can and prostrate in the gods go for refuge. When I was supreme amongst humans, you were born in this earth, you played out the seven strides and then said, I'm supreme in this world. To you, a wise then I prostrate. The pure bodies form supremely pure, wisdom ocean like a golden mountain. Fame that blazes in the three worlds, winner of the best, Lord, to you prostrate. With supreme science, face like a spotless moon, color like gold, to you prostrate. Thus free like you, the three worlds are not incomparable, wise one, to you prostrate. The Savior having great compassion, the founding having all understanding, the field of merit that caused like a vast ocean, to you the one counter dust and prostrate. The purity that frees from attachment, the virtue that frees from the lower realms, the one part, sublime pure reality, the Dharma that pacifies and prostrate. Those who are liberated and show the part of liberation, the holy field qualified realizations, were devoted to the moral precepts, to you sublime community intending a virtue and prostrate. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, homage to the Dharma refuge, homage to the great Sangha. To all three, every vote homage. For all worldly of respect, bound with bodies, as many realms in all aspects, with supreme fate, I pay homage. Do not commit any non virtuous actions, perform only perfect virtuous actions, subdue your mind thoroughly. This is the teaching of the Buddha. A star, a visibration, a flame of a lamp, an illusion, drop or a dew or a bubble, a dream, a flash of light in a cloud, seek on these things as such. To this merits, may all sentient beings attain the rank of all seeing, subdue the fool falls, and be delivered from samsara ocean. Perturbed by the waves, aging, sickness, and death. I prostrated Arya Triple Gem. Thus, I heard one time the Bhagwan was dwelling on the Mount Virgin's Mountain. He was geared together with a great community of monks and a great community of Bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagwan was absorbed in the concentration of Karataka's phenomena called profound perfection. Also, at that time, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avilisvara looked upon the very practice of profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five experts also empty in nature. Then, to the power of the Buddha, the Vambashara Putra said to the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avilisvara, 
how should Eddie's son of the lunch should practice activities the following activities. He said that and the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avilisvara said this to the member Shariputra. Shariputra and his son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice activities, profound perfection of wisdom, should look upon it like this. Correctly I'm repeating, behold, those five aggregates also as empty in nature. Form is empty, emptiness form, uh, form empty is not other than empty, form and empty, <laughs> form is not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, and composition of factors, conscience are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness without characteristics, unproduced, unseized, stainless, without stain, not, and not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness has no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no resistance factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visible form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomena. There is no element, up to and including no mild element, and the mental conscious element. There is no ignorance, extinction of ignorance, and so on, up to include no aging and death, no extinction, aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and part. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas will lie and dwell perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. And all the Buddhas who dwell in three times, also manifest a complete awakened, unsurprised, perfect, complete in life, in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurprised mantra, the mantra equal to an equal, the mantra truly pacified all suffering should be known as the truth, since it's not false. The amount of perfection of wisdom is declared. Tayatan, gata gata, para gata, para samgata, bodhi so Shariputra, the bodhisattva and mahasattva should train the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commanded the bodhisattva and mahasattva, Arya Avilisvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of the lineage. It is like that. It is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom, just as you indicated, and even tell the gods rejoice. The Bhagavan having thus spoken, the Venerable Putra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, Arya Avikisvara, and those surrounding there entirely, along with the wards and gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandharvas, were overjoyed and highly praised, spoken by Bhagavan. Uh, I persuade to the gathering of the Kinis of the three chakras who abide of the Holy Use in space by the power of your clear voice and magical emanation. Look at the prediction like a mother for a child. Aka samarasana samaraya pe tayata gata gata para gata para samgata bodhisattva. By the teachings of the supreme jewel possessing the power of truth, may in and out hence be transformed, may it be dispelled, and may it be pacified. May all negative forces opposed to the Dhamma be completely pacified, and may the host of 84,000 obstacles be pacified. And may it be separated from problems half conditioned to the Dhamma. May all enjoyments be coins with the Dhamma, and may there be spaciousness and perfect happiness here and right now. The foundation of all good qualities is the kind and perfect pure guru. Correctly devoting to the guru is the root of the part. By clean seeing this, applying great effort, please bless me to rely upon the guru with great respect. Understanding the precious freedom of this rebirth is found only once. It's greatly meaningful and difficult to find again. Please bless me to generate quickly in the mind stream. Honestly, they and I take the lessons. This life is impermanent as a water bubble. Remember how quickly it decays and death comes. After death, the shadow shadow falls the body. The reason of right that karma follow. Finding firm and definite conviction in this, please bless me always to be careful, to abandon even the slightest negativities and accomplish all virtuous deeds. Seeking some side pleasures is the door to all suffering. They are uncertain, cannot be relied upon. Recognize these shortcomings, please bless me to generate a strong wish for the bliss of liberation. That by the spirit thoughts, mindfulness, alertness, and great caution arise. The root of the teaching is given the Prachimoksha vows. Please bless me to accomplish this essential practice. Just have fallen to receive samsara, so of all modern migratory beings. Please bless me to see this, train the Supreme Bodhicitta, and bear the responsibility of free migratory beings. Even if I have developed only Bodhicitta, but do not practice three types of morality, I will not achieve enlightenment. With my clear recognition of this, please bless me to practice Bodhisattva vows of great energy. Once I've pacified distraction to wrong objects and correctly realized and analyzed the meaning of reality, Please bless me to generate quickly my mind street, the unified part of karma by my special insight. Have me become a pure vessel, a training in general path. Please bless me to enter the holy gateway of the fortune to the supreme Vajabhikha. 
At a time, the base of accomplishing two attainments is keeping pure vows in the mind. As become firmly convinced of this, please bless me to protect these vows and pledge like my life. Then, having realized the importance of the two stages, the essence of the Vajrayana, by practicing with great energy, never giving up the four sections, please bless me to realize the teaching of the Holy Guru. Like that, may the Gurus show the noble part and spiritual friends who practice it for long lives. Please bless me to pacify completely out and in the hymnsis. In all my lives, never separate from perfect gurus. May I enjoy the magnificent Dharma. By complete equality, states and parts, may I quickly attain the state of Vajrayana. Jango Bado Dani Yazuji Dagi Chishi Gibson Dola Penje Sangye Do Bajo Sangye Chudan Sony Sona Jango Bado Dani Yazuji Dagi Chishi Gibson Dola Penje Sangye Do Bajo Sangye Chudan Sony Sona Jango Bado Dani Yazuji Dagi Chishi Gibson Dola Penshe Sangye Do Bajo Sangye yeah, so um, before we start, maybe good to start with a quotation and well, also quotation of Arya Nagarjuna. As you know, Arya Nagarjuna wrote various texts on, on, uh, on emptiness, you know, six kind of masterpieces on, on, on on the logic of emptiness and then one text in relation with the, uh, the, the quotes uh, from the Sutra proving his logic that this was not his own made thing but actually came from the Sutra. So there's kind of seven major teachings of, of uh, Arya Nagarjuna but Arya Nagarjuna also wrote praises and, and, and uh, practical uh, texts like practical texts like the letter for a friend for example right it's basically uh, a lambrim text, yeah. Even before Atisha, as we know, there were already uh, certain lambrim texts, like Letter for a Friend, for example. But Arya Nagarjuna also wrote uh, various praises, you know, as we, as you know, the one we supposed to be doing in May, but then uh, COVID got me and, and <laughs> we couldn't meet, right? So uh, praise the world transcendent, yeah. It was another praise by Arya Nagarjuna. Uh, praising the Buddha, for example, or praising and praise the Vajra mind, for example. So a very inspiring text about the nature of the mind, so to say. Praise Arya Nagarjuna. And um, yeah, so that's uh, also the text for, for today is also uh, praise satisfying sentient beings or praise to honor sentient beings. Depends how you translate uh, the text. Um, yeah, there's also praise. But yeah, in order to introduce this praise, maybe start with a quotation of Arya Nagarjuna and well, from his uh, fundamental wisdom text. Yeah, and then well, the 27th chapter of that text where it says, Kanga Godam De La Chatsalo, which translates as, moved out of compassion, you will eliminate wrong views, you teacher of the sublime Dharma, to Godam Buddha, I pay homage. Yeah, so that's the first line. It says uh, moved out of compassion. Yeah, so moved out of compassion. That refers to the the, the realization of, of bodhicitta, right? Or the, the, that the Buddha said that Arjunagarjuna said of the Buddha that the Arjunagarjuna here is praising the Buddha for a particular purpose. Yeah, first that the Buddha is kind of a valid person we can rely upon, and one of the reasons why Buddha is a valid person is because the Buddha has moved out of compassion. Yeah. We often moved out of the afflictions, as we know, that for us is, is 
um, without effort, very easy to generate anger or, or desire or, or jealousy or pride without too much effort uh, is generated in split seconds, right? Well, if we meditate on love and kindness, compassion, patience, then it takes us quite some effort to get a little bit experience of uh, these, these constructive forms of thinking or constructive forms of mind. So that implies that our habituation is sometimes stronger to these kind of afflictions, so to say, rather than to these constructive forms of thinking. You know? But then the Buddha is the opposite, right? The Buddha, it says, Arinagjuna said of the Buddha, moved out of compassion. So moved here means that the Buddha is, is moved, meaning going in a direction without effort, right? Yeah. So that's what it means, you know, that the Buddha is moved out of compassion without effort. If you get a realization, if you contemplate love and kindness and compassion over a long period of time, then at one point of time, it becomes spontaneous, right? It becomes a realization, as we call it. Same when learning a language. In the beginning, you struggle a lot with, with you know, you, you just catch the beginning of the sentence and the end of the sentence, and in the middle, you lost, right? If you learned another language, you know what I'm talking about, yeah? or driving a car for the first time. Now, in electric cars, it's all more easy. Uh, it's also easier, but, you know, in the early days, I mean, th those cars still exist, that, you know, when you first time drive a car, then you really have to think, okay, now is the gear, and I have to put the right <laughs> pedals down, otherwise I'm going to uh, make a mess of the car, right? So you, you really have to think the first time you drive a car. But then over time, it becomes like automatic, you know? You, you can do it without thinking about it. So that's in a similar way. Our mind training is very similar. Initially, we have to put a lot of effort and we have to sit down and contemplate again and again and again and again. But then over time, it becomes spontaneous, you know? And then also over time, what does that mean over time? It becomes spontaneous. It's not that, you know, after a weekend on... on or a day on, on these kind of topics, then your mind is completely changed. That's unfortunately not the case. It would be nice, but unfortunately that's not the case. To change the mind takes a long period of time. And we should have the effort and endurance and, and, and patience and, and yeah, the attitude to keep going. You know, if you, for example, study um, or read the masters of the past and in particular, uh, you know, like 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 his holiness, uh, always putting so much effort and 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 um, kaza, emphasis on on bodhicitta and compassion, and that it's going to take time to develop. You know, and then not only his holiness in his present lifetime talks about it a lot, but also previous incarnations. Right, if you read the book of the Kadam, and in particular uh, part two of that book, then you see in the conversation between. Georgia Tisha and Malotsawa and, and uh, Gyawadun Trompa, that they had a conversation. And then Gyawadun Trompa said, you know, don't talk about these things about my previous lifetime. And then Tisha said, I'm your teacher, so <laughs> I decide <laughs> what to do. And then they talked about these aspects. And then it's very interesting conversations, right? That seeing that the previous incarnation of Don Trompa, Don Trompa, as you know, is the same uh, line of incarnations as is holding the 14 Dalai Lama, right? So this 14 is just a number, but there's many more before that, right? So then you can read that uh, the previous lifetimes of Don Tompa, that as a Bodhisattva or as an aspiring Bodhisattva, engage in decades of, 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 of meditation on Bodhicitta, right? So, so if you look at those aspects of mind training, then our little difficulties sometimes in Oh, I tried to practice patience, but I lost it again uh, a few days after I was meditating on patience, right? So that's good to know that, you know, don't expect too many changes coming up, but just keep going, right? So then over time, and then in particular, if you think about a long, longer picture of, of, of lifetimes of, of development, then of course, over time, it's possible to change the mind in a very constructive way forward, you know. So yeah, then the Buddha did something similar that over many decades and, and many lifetimes, in each lifetime, many decades, contemplating these aspects of the mind. And then eventually, 
generated this kind of uh, yeah realization of bodhicitta right and if you have bodhicitta then whatever you do becomes a cause for enlightenment yeah, so that's kind of a very very powerful and a very inspiring uh, state of mind whatever you do becomes a cause for enlightenment because when you have this bodhicitta in your continuum then it is spontaneous right at this time we call it when it's uncontrived when it's spontaneous when it comes up without effort then uh, because the habituation has been built up over lifetimes then becomes very stable in your continuum and then uh, it's very easy to to yeah to generate it i mean you don't have to generate it anymore because it's there you know so whatever you do becomes a cause for enlightenment yeah and and then because it's a cause for enlightenment then what what Ari Nagarjuna says in this first line moved out of compassion right so the buddha does everything to try to benefit beings whatever is possible without making distinction between friend enemy stranger color of the skin race culture those who benefit the buddha those who harm the buddha the buddha is only interested in the happiness of beings and and that beings are free from suffering yeah, so that's why uh, the, uh, Nagarjuna praises the Buddha in the first line that the Buddha is kind of we can see the Buddha as a valid teacher yeah in if you for those who have a bit more knowledge about the Dharma then you know there's a text uh, on the Pramana Vartika yeah of, of logic and reasoning by by uh, by Dharma Kirti you know and there is very interesting in the second chapter of, of the Pramana Vartika that that Dhammakirti proves why is the Buddha a valid person, right? And then he starts with great compassion and then goes into, it's a very interesting structure actually, then goes into the habituations over lifetimes of the Buddha's um, quest for enlightenment and, and generating this compassion over lifetimes to make it very strong. Then after seeing that, that, that it takes lifetimes, then and uh, Dharma Kishti thinks, okay, how do we prove rebirth? And then he goes into the, the logic behind that consciousness can only be produced by previous moment of consciousness, right? So in the Buddhist context, we talk about it quite a lot. Yeah, and also from scientific findings, we can think about need that experience or, or, or children remembering previous lifetimes to examine the continuity of consciousness, right? So that's kind of how we, from a Buddhist perspective, uh, try to generate. Of course, there's various views about consciousness and brain and and yeah but that's kind of um we should explore rather than just saying i don't believe it or i do believe it it's very important to to explore it and and check it out you know the buddha said don't believe whatever i say uh, but you should examine you know whatever i say if it's true or not so that's kind of a very important aspect of the buddhist teaching yeah. so then uh, Dhammakirti went into past and future lifetimes and proved it with logic and reasoning, and then goes into very interesting topics of, of developing the mind and, and eliminating obscurations to liberation and omniscience by the power of what we call the yogic direct perception or a realization of, of, of emptiness and well, a direct perception, and how that completely eliminates all afflictions together with their seeds, you know. And then motivated with love and kindness, compassion in particular. Bodhicitta, it has the potential to achieve omniscience. Right? So it's um, very important aspects of, of, of the teaching as well. So moved out of compassion, that's the first line in this praise by Arya Nagarjuna praising the Buddha. But in many other works of the Nalana tradition, we can see various uh, points of emphasis on great compassion and on bodhicitta. For example, if you take the supplement to the middle way, right, that, that, that is a masterpiece as we at the moment see it as the text on, or the main text, one of the main texts on emptiness. Uh, there's kind of this, the, the Chandakirti's uh, yeah, root text supplement to the middle way and there's an auto commentary and, and a kind of uh, explaining the clear words, another commentary. And as Honest Dalai Lama says, he reads that every day, right? So that, is seems to be quite an essential and important text you know that text mainly deals with emptiness yeah, in particular chapter number six as you know of, of chandakirti supplement to the middle way is mainly about the topic emptiness but in the beginning of the text 
very interesting that Chandrakirti doesn't praise emptiness or doesn't praise the Buddha for various qualities, but he praises great compassion, right? And why does he great, praise great compassion? Because he says, whatever spiritual attainment there is, depends on the words of the Buddha, right? If it's the spiritual attainment of, of liberation, if it's the spiritual attainment of enlightenment, or spiritual attainment of, of true paths, or true liberation, or true cessation, right? So whatever spiritual realization or attainment there is, uh, whatever, yeah, realization of the path there is, depends on the teaching of the Buddha, right? Uh, to, without the teaching of the Buddha, it's very difficult to get realizations, you know? Of course, insights, yes, or, or understandings, yes. You know, when I had a, a dialogue with Carlo Rovelli, um, yeah, and we met separate from the dialogue. And when we met separate from the dialogue, he asked me, he said, do I have to become a Buddhist to understand emptiness? Because he was really, <laughs> he was really into Nagarjuna's philosophy, you know, and, and that, that he saw the incredible um, kind of, um, how do I say, the, 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 the common aspects between Nagarjuna's philosophy and quantum mechanics. Yeah, so it's very, it's, yeah, it's, I think, one of the physicists who, who is very close, if not almost similar interpretations that Arya Nagarjuna has. Very, very interesting personality. So he asked me, do I have to become a Buddhist to really understand emptiness? So I said, no, just for intellectual understanding, no, you don't have to, right? But I didn't tell him for realizations, most likely you, you have to move in a particular part, otherwise you don't really get realizations, right? So, so that's a distinction there to be made. So then, uh, then what Chandakirti is saying here, because all those aspects of the realizations and, and uh, high attainments, they depend on the teaching of the Buddha, right? And then the Buddha's teachings depended on the Buddha. And the Buddha arose from, that's another way to, to translate it, uh, the teaching of the Buddha arose from the Buddha, and the Buddha arose from being a Bodhisattva before, right? And being a Bodhisattva arose from Bodhicitta. Yeah, the mind of enlightenment is when you have the mind of enlightenment in your continuum, you become a Buddha, right? And then the the mind of enlightenment of Bodhicitta is rooted in great compassion, because great compassion is a substantial cause for Bodhicitta to arise. Yeah, so there's various uh, reasons for that. Why is um, uh, great compassion the substantial cause? One of the reasons is looking at the definition of bodhicitta. There in the definition mentioned two aspirations, a causal aspiration and a resultant aspiration, right? So one, the causal aspiration is great compassion, a wish for others to be free of suffering. And the resultant aspiration is wanting to become a Buddha for that purpose, right? So that's one interpretation why uh, great compassion is a root or the substantial cause for bodhicitta because without great compassion, you don't have the wish to become a Buddha, first of all, right? So great compassion is one of the aspirations, but without that aspiration, you would not have the second aspiration of wanting to become a Buddha. Yeah, so that's one reason or logical uh, reason why, um, you know, why great compassion is a substantial cause. Then another quotation, or uh, you can refer to, in, in, is quoted in the swift part of the Lamrim by the Panchen Lama. We will be coming out somewhere in March by wisdom, I've been informed. Uh, the swift part is one of the two experiential commentaries of the Lamrim. Yeah, we have the easy part and the swift part. So the translation by wisdom will come out, I think, somewhere in March, I heard. Uh, so there are also uh, quotes uh, from the Kriya Samaja lineage prayer. Yeah, there's a, a sadhana by, by, composed by Lam Tsongkhapa. And there in the lineage prayer is a very interesting, very interesting verse. You know, it says, uh, you know, it says, um, Kasa. Uh, Saban, yeah, so it says compassion is the seed. Yeah. Great compassion is the seed. Oh, yeah. First it says, yeah, tanyom, tanyom shita. Yeah. So first, sorry. First it says the, the equanimity is the basis. 
Yes, we know equanimity is a basis for developing uh, either the six cause and effect method or exchanging self for other method, right? So the, the equanimity is the basis. So it says she, yeah, basis or fields, you can say. Equanimity is the basis of fields, you know? And then great compassion is the seat, it says, you know? So the basis is equanimity and the seat, the substantial cause, so to say, is uh, great compassion. Yeah. Uh, then it says uh, love and kindness is the moisture. Yeah, love and kindness is the moisture, so to say. And then depending on the basis and the moisture, then it says developing, is a very free translation, okay? Developing great compassion uninterruptedly, right? Uninterruptedly, it generates the, the tree of, of bodhicitta or the tree of, of, of the mind of enlightenment, right? The tree of the mind of enlightenment with the fruits of omniscience, you know? So it's a very interesting verse actually because it talks about the substantial cause of bodhicitta and what bodhicitta produces. Yeah, so to generate bodhicitta, you need great compassion and then the, the tree, right, produces the results or the fruits of omniscience because bodhicitta, everything you do with bodhicitta is a cause for enlightenment. And why do you want to accomplish enlightenment? In order to have this omniscience, in order to um, have this mind to be able to know all object of knowledge in order to really lead sentient beings further away from samsara all the way up to enlightenment and 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 uh, yeah uh, and, and and the bodies of buddha for example so without omniscience or without clairvoyance is very difficult to benefit beings right if you really want to help a person then it's always first okay sit down and talk what's the issue how is being caused what is the nature how can we deal with it how can we solve it we need a lot of kind of aspects of of contemplation and thinking about it in various from various angles and then try to come to a solution or, or uh, yeah so it's, it's very complex it's not easy right but if you have omniscience if you just know exactly what is wrong and why something is wrong and how to solve it if you just know then that is, is much easier right so that's why we 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 strive or the bodhisattva strive for this omniscience and also if you read Atisha's uh, Lamp of the Part, as well as the outer commentary on that, then it's very clear that Atisha uh, stresses the importance of clairvoyance to benefit others. You know, yeah, so uh, there's quite a lot of emphasis in, in, by Atisha. You know? so, so then it says also in this particular verse from the lineage groups of the Guru Samaja, there it says, you know, that, that the, the basis is equanimity then uh, the seed is, is, is great compassion. And, and the, 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 yeah, you can say that the heat or moisture or the corporate conditions, so to say, is love and kindness, right? And then with that right ki kind of mixture of course and conditions, then it develops into bodhicitta with the fruits of omniscience. And then it says, I, I made supplications to omniscience. So meaning I would like to accomplish this all-knowing mind to benefit others. So it is rooted in great compassion. Yeah. So there also it's not a way to see that great compassion is a substantial cause for bodhicitta to rise. Yeah. So then we go back to Chandrakirti, who says that you know all the realizations and accomplishments comes from the teaching of the Buddha and that arose from the Buddha and the Buddha arose from bodhisattvas and the bodhisattvas arose from bodhicitta and bodhicitta arose from great compassion as being the substantial cause, right? So then you see why actually is Chandrakirti in the beginning of his text, supplement to the middle way, why is Chandrakirti actually praising great compassion? Because it's the starting point of everything, you know, of the whole path to enlightenment. And yeah, there's yeah, many more uh, quotations or reasonings you can use to prove uh, that uh, great compassion is so essential in, in, in the spiritual part. And now we can know that even on a kind of secular or universal level, uh, compassion has great benefits. Yeah, that's been well documented in various scientific research that proves the benefits of, 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 of compassion. And also there's a lot of uh, 
different developments, as you know, in particular in the US, I think Europe is a bit behind within the universities when it comes to uh, these kind of aspects of, of the training. You know? But yeah, there's very interesting developments going on in, in various fields of, of the academic world, understanding the benefits of compassion and just turn it in a more secular or universal kind of aspect to benefit a greater amount of, of people. Right, so that's kind of from various angles, from spirituality as well as from um, angles of science, you can see the benefits of, of, of great compassion. Yeah. So uh, that's the first line of the initial quote by Arya Nagarjuna, where it says, "Moved out of compassion." Right, as the first line. And then the second line, Arya Nagarjuna praises the Buddha and says, "Moved out of compassion, you will eliminate wrong views." Yeah, so then the second line is referring to elimination, particular ignorance, right, being the root of samsara, and ignorance can only be eliminated with understanding ultimate reality, yeah, or, or emptiness, so to say. Yeah, so in order to understand emptiness, we need to depend on various forms of reasoning to really understand the ultimate nature of reality, which is kind of what we call slightly hidden phenomena. We need to use reasoning and proof to understand that particular reality. And whatever appears to our mind is not always, uh, doesn't have to be actually the reality. And we know that in various forms, even in, in neuroscience, people like NL sets uh, come to that conclusion that whatever appears to the mind is not uh, reality. Yeah, last one was it. Yeah, yesterday actually. <laughs> yeah, sorry, <laughs> sometimes I, I lose track of time. But yesterday we had a, I had a dialogue with Anit Set, one of the quite well-respected neuroscientists, was a very interesting personality. And why? Because he's he, he is opening up to the subjective aspect of consciousness, right? So there's not many respected scientists within the classical field of neuroscience to to is is capable of proving with uh, empirical evidence that there is a subjectivity of the mind, right? It's very interesting. Yeah, of course, he has various views about consciousness and brain and, and this, yeah, slightly different. And yesterday also he said, yeah, I don't, we have a disagreement here and that's perfectly fine. <laughs> yeah, that's good in a dialogue, it's good to have common ground, but also not agree all the time, right? <laughs> so yeah, it's very interesting. But also he talks about, what is perception? And perception, as he called it, is a controlled hallucination. It's very interesting. <laughs> of course, it talks about sensory perception. He also says whatever appears is not actually the reality. It's more from inside out than outside in. What it, it's not really from the object that, that we know what the object is, but it's from, from our, our perspective, from our mind outward, go from inside going outwardly, that we think it's like this. Right, so it's very interesting from from uh, yeah a neuroscientist in within the classical field of, of 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 neuroscience to say something like that and then prove because of this he proved the subjectivity of consciousness but the consciousness still remains a property of the brain within his kind of field right so it's a very interesting actually very interesting person and and he's open to dialogue and and but yeah he's quite clear about his own kind of um, opinion and and distinction so that's that's good. Yeah, I think it was quite a fruitful uh, dialogue and we're going to meet probably again to discuss various aspects of consciousness. Very interesting. Yeah. So that means that whatever appears to our mind is not reality. And then in Buddhism, we go a step further because we say things appear as distant and cut off. As we say it in the mind only school, for example. The objects, if you look at the screen, it really appears there just completely separate from your consciousness. But is that the reality or not? That's the question, right? Yeah. So that's not really a reality, but for us, it feels like a reality, you know? And, and things appear as existing from their own side, but we know everything is dependent. And we know that nothing can exist from its own side. Yeah. So that's exactly why Arena Juna, in this, this quotation we started with, you moved out of compassion, you eliminate wrong views, meaning the, by depending on the teachings of the Buddha, be capable of eliminating all these wrong views, of understanding reality, and in particular, the wrong view of ignorance, of grasping at the inner end I am I, or an inner end kind of self, you know? 
so that 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 by depending on the Buddha's on teachings on emptiness, be able to counteract this ignorance. Yeah, emptiness is a mind that completely understands. Uh, yeah, sorry, emptiness. When emptiness has been realized, right? That mind that realizes emptiness, the way the, that mind actually sees reality is exactly the opposite of from ignorance. Because ignorance sees an inherent I, and the mind sees the absence of an inherent I, right? So that proves that with the mind realizing selflessness, you can eliminate ignorance. Yeah. So because ignorance is a mind that sees or holds on to or grasps at, you know, a kind of inherent I, and that causes all the destructive emotions to arise. And the mind realizing emptiness sees exactly the opposite of that. So it becomes the direct antidote, as we call it, to its ignorance. And that's why the realization of emptiness is the only direct antidote to its uh, ignorance. But in order to become a direct antidote, you have to have the mere appearance of the lack of inherent existence coming to your mind, right? And that's only possible by the power of various reasons to refute the object of refutation or to refute this inherent existence. Yeah, that inherent existence is something that appears, but it's not reality, and that has to be refuted, right? And that can only be refuted by powerful reasoning. In a similar way, when you wake up in the morning and you had a bad dream, and you wake up and you're still shaken up a little bit, you know? And then it, it takes time to, to drink a little bit of water and then see, oh, I'm in my room, it's perfectly fine, it's okay, nothing happened, it's just a dream. Yeah, so by the power of reasoning, you're capable of counteracting that misunderstanding. Yeah, so you need reasoning to counteract misunderstanding. Similar, we see with people with with more mental mental challenges or trauma. You know, you can have a temporary treatment, but if you don't train the mind in a particular way, you don't move much further, right? So processing the trauma is very important. You know, that that and then using various forms of reasoning to 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 move a particular direction. And that's very true for all forms of destructive emotions, as we know, you know. To eliminate anger, you just have to sit down and think about the faults of anger for a long period of time and be convinced about the faults of anger and then contemplate the benefits of practicing patience and be convinced of the, practice, the benefits of practicing patience. And then over time, the mind shifts, right? So that's kind of uh, how we can deal with various mental challenges challenges you know so to counteract ignorance we need a lot of reasoning and the king of reasoning is of course dependent origination yeah, so that's what it says in this verse by Arya Nagarjuna we started with mood of our compassion you will eliminate wrong views you teacher of the sublime dharma yeah, the third line it says you teacher of the sublime dharma yeah, so the third line proves the the second line right and that to you eliminate wrong views means the wrong view of ignorance that's been eliminated by the power of the sublime teaching of the, of the Buddha, right? And you, because uh, you moved wrong views, you teacher, you teacher of the sublime Dharma. Yeah, so the sublime Dharma here refers to the teachings of dependent origination. Yeah, by the power of dependent origination, we can eliminate this ignorance. Yeah, so that's why Arunagajuna is a very skillful way. To, to praise the Buddha out of his motivation, being compassion, right? And then seeing that we can trust a person like that and not only trust a person like that, but then also Arjen Juna says in the second and third line, you will eliminate wrong views, you teach of the sublime Dharma. So the teachings of dependent origination help us to eliminate this ignorance, right? It is very, it's a very profound verse actually that you just don't praise the Buddha because of the Buddha's incredible fame or qualities as a, as a person. No, his teaching on dependent origination is being praised. You know why is teaching on dependent origination being praised? Because that's the only way to eliminate uh, ignorance. You know, and and if you study other texts, um, yeah, actually we didn't do that one because that was the structure would be perfect if we have done. The, the word, uh, the praise in the, 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 the word of transcendent or praising the Buddha, right? There's another praise, the Arya Nagarjuna, we're supposed to be doing in May, but it didn't happen. But there also, in that, in that particular text, 
Arunagjuna praises the Buddha because of this teaching of the pen origination, right? And also, you know, Lama Sokapa wrote this incredible, inspiring text in praise of the pen origination. Also, after having realized praising the Buddha for his incredible teachings on independent origination, right? So that's kind of um, what it says in this verse. Yeah, you move out of compassion, you eliminate wrong views, you teach her the sublime Dharma to go to Buddha, I pay homage. Yeah, so to pay homage to the Buddha in that way is quite um, quite amazing, you know, uh, so to say. Yeah, so yeah, that's where the teachings come from and the teachings then originate by the motivation of great compassion and then uh, by that great compassion to eliminate all wrong views by the power of, of the teachings of the pen origination, right? And that brings us to the needs to start with this motivation of great compassion and then based on that, uh, develop uh, this kind of realization of emptiness. Yeah? So um, that's, although those things go together, right? So, because if you, on the, the stronger your understanding of emptiness is, the stronger compassion becomes. The stronger compassion becomes, the more you really want to get rid of obscurations to omniscience. If you really have strong compassion and you want to do something about the suffering of others, you see the need to understand emptiness, right? And in particular, the compassion that is a more substantial form of compassion. We have all kinds of compassions, right? Yeah, the compassion of mere suffering of others or the compassion of realizing the subtle impermanence of others and then having compassion or the suffering of realizing emptiness and then having compassion. So the last compassion is much stronger, right? The, the, in one way, if you have strong compassion and you see compassion is defined as the wish for others to be free of suffering, right? So you have to know what suffering is. And then we know suffering is not merely the suffering of suffering or the suffering of change, but the Buddha said, when the Buddha said you should know suffering, the all-pervasive compounded form of suffering, right? And that 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 implies as long as we have um, karma and afflictions, we're stuck, right? As long as we have karma and afflictions, we're stuck in samsara and this has to be eliminated. Yeah? And in order to eliminate karma and afflictions, we have to eliminate ignorance, you know? So then you see if you have an understanding of emptiness, then your understanding of suffering is stronger, renunciation is stronger. And compassion be strong, becomes stronger, as we can see, for example, in the verse verse of 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 uh, Kaza, of Shanti Deva's uh, chapter nine on emptiness, right? That all the teachings of the Buddha are meant for the purpose of teaching emptiness. So, if you wish to stop the suffering of others, you should engage in this direction of understanding emptiness, right? So that's the first verse in um, in the Bodhisattva chapter nine. Right, a very free translation, but um, and then on the commentaries on that verse, it also says that, uh, for example, there's one famous commentary: "His Holiness likes a lot" by by Dzogchen Kempo, uh, Pelden, right? That 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 it talks about, you know, if you have a realization of emptiness, compassion automatically increases. So it is very interesting, and that's probably true it, because the more you understand emptiness, the more you understand suffering. Yeah, so the more you understand suffering, the stronger the wish for others to be free of suffering. And also the capacity to, to help others to be free of suffering. You know? Yeah, so that's kind of a few important aspects of, of the part, so to say, before we go to the actual text. And then, yeah, it starts all with compassion, as we saw with Chandakirti. It starts with compassion, with the praise Arinagajuna. Uh, you moved out of compassion, starts with compassion. So yeah, generating compassion is quite essential. And also uh, Shantideva said that, you know, you're praising the Buddhas, but actually you should praise sentient beings because thanks to sentient beings, you can generate compassion. Thanks to sentient beings, you can develop patience. Thanks to sentient beings, you can generate uh, morality, uh, for example, right? So all the qualities or the perfections we generate is thanks to the kindness of sentient beings. So that's probably one of the reasons why Arya Nagarjuna uh, wrote this uh, text. You know, uh, yeah, in praise to, yeah, the one, the version we use, uh, it says in praise, praise to satisfying sentient beings, or uh, sometimes it can be translated as praise of honoring sentient beings. So important to know in this text is, it's not Nagarjuna who is speaking, right? It is 
the Buddha who is speaking. So Nagarjuna writes the text from the point of view that the Buddha is actually, actually explaining. You know, that's that's how you should read the text. Yeah. Yeah, so then starts with homage to Manjushri, yeah, the, or the youthful Manjushri. Uh, that's a reference to yeah, the Buddha of, of wisdom. Yeah, so um, that that has mostly been added by the translator, yeah, of the Tibetan text. Yeah, it falls probably most likely then in the category of the of the Abhidhamma Pitaka among the three Pitakas, uh, Vinaya, Sutra, and Abhidhamma Pitaka. Yeah. Okay, so then the first verse it says respecting me is no not other than respecting sentient beings exactly what shantideva said you know if you respect the buddha so much but actually you should respect sentient beings even more because it's thanks to their kindness you accomplish uh, the realizations of the part right yeah. yeah so that's what the buddha said if you respect me this is the same or you should actually respect sentient beings you know whoever does not give up compassion is respecting me. So the Buddha gives advice, right? Uh, the real way to respect uh, the Buddha or respect the teacher or whatsoever is to put into practice the advice of the teacher or the advice of the Buddha, right? The real offering or the real respect comes from that aspect, you know? So that's what the Buddha says here also. If you want to, you don't have to pay respect to me in a kind of you know, very kind of physical, uh, respectful way, but mentally, it's, the respect should come from the mind, right? And then if you do all very holy around uh, the Buddha, but then you don't really uh, do are nice to others, then the Buddha said, you know, there's something wrong, right? So that has been indicated here, you know. Um, yeah. Those who fall and abide by giving up compassion can be pulled from there by compassion. Yeah, but not other. So, yeah, uh, that means that compassion is essential in our development of, of, of becoming a better human being all the way up to enlightenment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who fall and abide by giving up compassion. Yeah. Good. Allez. Yeah. So here also it says, um, yeah, everything depends on compassion, right? So wherever you go in samsara, whatever direction you go, uh, if you give it up, you go in the wrong direction. If you practice it, you go in the right direction. And even if you give it up, then others can pull you back again by the power of compassion, right? So it's kind of a very interesting analogy in the last two lines. Yeah. Whoever subsequently abides in compassion for sentient beings, they please me and also carry the responsibility of the teachings. And so that's, that's what it is, right? The Buddha is only pleased when we... Uh, develop ourselves into the part, right? The Buddha is not pleased the more offerings we made. Of course, the Buddha sees when we make an offering in, in, in the form of an altar or something, then it's always important to know why we do that. You know, I make I made the same mistake myself. Sometimes it becomes a habit, right? You get up, you wash your face and you put your water balls or something like that. <laughs> but sometimes you don't really you don't really think about why you're doing that. Right, you know that? Yeah, so we do it quite often, you know. So it's very important to be aware why are we doing this, you know? And then thinking that I'm doing this because that's the Buddha there. And I want to have the same qualities, you know, and that's why I make these offerings. I want to train my mind and become like that, you know. So that's kind of that's very important. We often just forget. <laughs> I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I often forget that kind of, <laughs> yeah, you make triple straight, do the water balls, but it's just like a habit, like same as people go to church or, 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 or in every religion, we have this aspect, right? In every religion, we have this kind of habits, you know, if it's Buddhism or Christianity or any other form of religion, we just go to the temple and, and burn some incense and, and, and then go home and then that's it right but the intention is not there then it's all the same <laughs> yeah. it doesn't really really produce a, a, a good ripening result right so it's very important to motivate yourself first then do the act and then make a strong prayer or dedication whatever religion you follow right so that's that's very important for us as those who consider themselves as buddhists also to to make sure we we, we do that and then there's more benefit right 
yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so it says here in this verse number two, so whoever subsequently abides in compassion for sentient beings, please me. Yeah, so that's more uh, pleasing the Buddha than just making offerings and not um, practicing kindness, for example. Right, so the Buddha is basically, if you, you know, if you really look at when the Buddha is happy or not, let's say there's one person who considers themselves as a Buddhist and one person does not consider themselves as a Buddhist, right? So then the person who considers that as a Buddhist puts some flowers there without thinking too much. And then the person who is not a Buddhist practice kindness. You know, recently I read a story about a lady who made a commitment for herself practicing kindness for 100 days. Very interesting. You know, she's not spiritual at all. Uh, I mean, not really in the sense as we normally see people in, in certain kind of. But the end, you see that, see that every day, an act of kindness, giving some food to a person living on the street or helping a person. She said, sometimes it was quite difficult. But over time, I felt very, very satisfied with life. Very interesting, you know. But then the Buddha will be happier with a person doing something like that than a person just who puts a flower there and without thinking too much, right? So that's, that's very interesting to see. What really pleases the Buddha is our own development with a good intention. And, 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 and try to do our best with a good motivation. And then the outcome, of course, is much more superior, right? So that's what it says here. So they please me if they really practice or act out of compassion and also carry the responsibility of the teachings. That's another aspect. So one aspect is compassion for sentient beings and the responsibility of the teachings because the responsibility of the teachings helps us to to preserve the teachings, right? And that's very important, you know. Um, to preserve the teachings for future generations is very essential, you know, that, that other people make a connection with these teachings and and certain, on different levels, right? Certain people, they made a connection and go straight into it and, and develop their minds and, and get realizations and certain people on the secular universe aspect get a connection. It's very important to have those various aspects. So within the FPMT organization, for example, we have the centers with in-depth study and they have on the side secular aspects. But when the centers for in-depth study are lacking, then over time, it will slowly, slowly water down, right? So it's very important to have kind of um, places where Buddhism is being studied in depth and then use that as a kind of, I would call that as a kind of uh, source. You know, to do all kind of activities, either other study programs or more universal uh, education. You know, it's very interesting. So that source is very, very, very important. You know, the, and His Holiness puts a lot of emphasis in the monastic institutions. His Holiness always said, said once he said to all the monks and nuns who were there, it was only for monks and nuns who were studying uh, in depth uh, the Buddhist doctrine. And then His Holiness said, okay. Who of you can say that you really are serious <laughs> or understand the Buddha Dharma, right? And then, of course, everybody put a hand up, right? <laughs> put a hand up. And then someone said, very interesting. He said, okay, it's your responsibility to take uh, action. And it's your responsibility to preserve the Dharma. I cannot do it all by myself. Very interesting statement, right? So that means that there should be a hardcore of, 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 of preserving this teaching. And then on the side, we have all kind of other programs related with that, you know, it's very interesting. Okay. Yeah, so that seems to be quite essential in, 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 in preserving what Buddha says here, because there's a responsibility of preserving these aspects. And that's probably also why His Holiness wants to move in various directions with secular or universal aspects to preserve various aspects for future generations. But if this kind of um, root is not really there, and then the other things will water down over time, right? Yeah, it was very interesting. I went to Oxford two weeks ago uh, to to give a course on on mind science and philosophy in in, in one particular department. It's called Casa um, Continuing Education. It's very interesting. And then the moderator, uh, she was very skillful, <laughs> of course. And then uh, she said, she said, "It's very interesting." She was surprised because she was completely new to to the tradition, right? To to Buddhism in general, in particular, the Nalana tradition. And she said, when I talk about that, that's still a living tradition, you know, of epistemology and reasoning in, in, in South India, for example. She said, wow, that's very inspiring, you know. And it's really needed to have monastics, she said, 
to, to preserve these kind of essential aspects of the part, right? It's very interesting to hear that from a person who is not even not even have studied Buddhism before, right? So that that same as the Buddha says here, it's important to preserve uh, the teachings. Yeah. So there's a responsibility for us and like like your center in New York and many other centers, uh, it's a kind of responsibility we have to carry. You know. Yeah. And then based on that uh, responsibility, then practice, of course, morality, hearing of the teachings and studying it, compassion, wisdom, and clarity can then referring to the clarity of meditation, right? Also put some eff- emphasis in that direction. Yeah, possessed by anyone is always an offering to the one gone to us, yeah, to, to the Buddha. So, so that means that the real offering to the Buddha is working for the benefit of beings and preserving the Dharma. Right. It's two, if you read dedications by Lama Tsongkhapa uh, or other great masters of the other traditions, right, then you see often a dedication is referring to those two aspects, right? Yeah, that to preserve the doctrine and to work for the benefit of beings, right? So that's because by preserving the doctrine, you have tools to work for the benefit of beings, and those tools can be seen in in traditional uh, Buddhist context, but also can be seen in a secular. Or universal context yeah that's verse number two then in verse number three it says uh, this accomplishment of benefits sentient beings i obtained only for the sake of sentient beings so the buddha walked for the benefit of sentient beings and buddhahood has been accomplished for the purpose of sentient beings right so the, the cause for becoming a buddha is for the purpose of sentient beings and the result of being a buddha is for the purpose of sentient beings right so that's kind of um very interesting relationship i perfectly hold this true body or there's one interpretation it is between brackets in the translation we use but it can also refer to that the buddha used his body for the benefit of beings right yeah so um, that's that's the causal interpretation right that the buddha used his body with the act of generosity uh, you know of parts of the body right and then from the resistant point of view that the bodies of a Buddha here between brackets says a true body, but you can also relate it to other bodies is for the sake of sentient beings. So the causal aspect of the body that the Buddha as a Bodhisattva work for others and the resultant aspect, having the bodies of a Buddha to work for benef- benefit beings. And we know the Buddha has kind of the, the two truth bodies, right? And then the form bodies, right? So the truth bodies we often say are for the purpose of self and the form bodies are for the purpose of others. Right, because if you have omniscience, then you have the right inner condition to help others. Right, so that's kind of the true body, you know, that the wisdom, in particular the wisdom true body, is for the purpose of, as we just talked about, clairvoyance being important, know other people's mind, and have omniscience being important. So that means that the the true body of the Buddha is is that particular purpose, right, to have the right tools to benefit. But to actual benefit is by the power of emanation bodies, right? Of the enjoyment body and the emanation body. So that's why we often say the truth bodies are for the purpose of self, and the the the, the form bodies are for the purpose of others, of directly benefiting others. Yeah, so that's you can read in, in the same line. But then you can also think the causal and and resultant aspects. The causal being the Buddha when he was still a bodhisattva, giving away parts of his body or giving up his life for others, right? And then uh, at the time of the result, using the bodies to benefit others, yeah. Those minds that harm sentient beings for whatever reason, since they do not respect me, they will not be taught the meaning, right? So they will never really understand the Buddhist doctrine. Yeah, if you if you study Buddhism, but then you harm beings, then we know for those who take refuge, we know if you take refuge in the Buddha, Dharma and the Sangha, yeah, there's, there's things to be practiced, there's things to be abandoned, and there's a different advice of after having taken refuge, as you know, explained in Lam Rim. But you also know in relation with the specific advice of refuge in relation with the, with the three uh, objects of refuge, then if you take refuge in the Dharma, you have to give up harming sentient beings, right? So that's kind of, the Buddha says, okay, if you are practicing as a Buddhist, you should not harm others, right? That's kind of one of the the advice after having taken refuge. So it says here, if you respect me, then of course you should not 
uh, harm sentient beings, right? Yeah, if you do so, then actually you you break your refuge commitment or your refuge. Um, yeah, it's very interesting uh, to see that, right? Yeah. And then, yeah, so if you harm sentient beings or wish to harm sentient beings or uh, whatever uh, reason, then it says, that's the way they don't really respect me. Yeah, the Buddha is not concerned of who respect me or not, but don't respect me in the sense, don't respect my teachings, right? That's what the Buddha says, because if you harm others, you don't really respect this aspect of, of refuge, right? Yeah, so the Buddha is not concerned of, of, of getting respect or not. The Buddha is completely beyond the eight worldly dramas, but for our purpose, uh, the Buddha said so, yeah. Okay, yeah, maybe we need a short, short break or not. Um, what is it, 10 minutes or so? Yeah, people all at home. So maybe uh, easy to stretch your legs and grab something to drink. Yeah, maybe 10 minutes then, yeah. So it's now 10 past 11 or something, 12 past 11, yeah. So then 22, it's a bit awkward, but yeah, that's how it is. 22, <laughs> 22 past, uh, yeah, okay, okay. Just uh, relax 10 minutes, okay? Okay, see you soon. Yeah, I'm back in New York. <laughs> it's so easy, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's quite amazing. Like a few years ago, you would never thought this would be possible, right? Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So before we start, uh, generate crack motivation. All right, so then, yeah, you see the importance of in the text in this particular place, what the Buddha said as being, you know, essential in, in our practice is to, to put it into practice, you know, then, then not only just studying it, but put it into practice uh, and work for the, try to do our best and work for the benefit of beings. Yeah, then in verse number four, as we go on in the next verse, then it says, uh, though it is a small benefit to sentient beings, it can become an offering, right? So, um, satisfying or honoring sentient beings' minds become an offering to the Buddha. And so that's uh, similar as we said before, that uh, you know, helping beings by itself is is a course for enlightenment in particular when it's also motivated in that direction, right? That's also an aspect. Normally, when you just engage in 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 kindness or, or good deeds, then it's a cause for happiness, right? It's a cause for happiness within samsara. But if it's motivated with, that's why bodhicitta is so important. If it's motivated with the wish for enlightenment, then those small things we engage in can become a huge result, right? All the way up to enlightenment. So that's kind of also important to always motivate ourselves correctly and then engage in, in, in kindness or, or like to help out wherever possible. Though it's a small benefit to sentient beings, it can become an offering to the Buddha. Yeah, satisfying or honoring sentient beings' minds becomes an offering. Having a nature of harmful thought or totally harming others, though offering a very good way, will not become an offering, right? So that's, yeah, as we really said before, if you just have harmful intent, then, um, then yeah. Although, Looking uh, with, with, with a harmful intent to an image of the Buddha creates a cause for enlightenment. That's, that's quite clear in, in, the, in the sutras in particular, in the concentration, King of Concentration Sutras, right? As we quoted by Atisha in the Lamp of the Path. But if you have harmful thoughts towards sentient beings, then it's a different story, right? It's very interesting, you know? Uh, because, yeah, harmful thoughts to sentient beings can motivate ourselves in the physical verbal behaviors right yeah and it prevents us from generating compassion because compassion is the opposite of harmful thoughts right compassion is a wish for others to be free of suffering yeah? so then if you have whatever harmful thought you have is basically a direct uh, enemy so to say of, of, of great compassion right so yeah as we know one of the 10 non-virtuous states of of, of uh, yeah, for the ten non-virtues, right? Harmful intent 
is something to be prevented or abandoned over time. Yeah, it's easier initially to, to practice physical and verbal behaviors or morality of the body and the speech, and then practice morality of the mind. And that's also why the 10 non-virtues are classified in, in, in body, speech, and mind aspects, right? That's, that's quite, um, it's all very, if you, there's so many divisions in Buddhism, as you know, but it's all very logically set out. You know, that's, that's very interesting to be aware of, of those aspects. You know? Because it's easier not to harm a person physically than it is not to harm a person verbally. And it's, it's more easy not to harm a person verbally than to have a negative thought about a particular individual, right? Yeah. And that's, yeah, that's not easy because those, <laughs> those thoughts, they come up even after many years of training, right? Sometimes you have just those negative thoughts popping up in relation with a particular individual. Yeah, and that's over time, those thoughts have to go, right? So that's why the more compassion we generate, then uh, the more possibility of, of eliminating those negative thoughts, you know? So that's kind of uh, the antidote, yeah. With compassion, I completely, so here it talks about what we just talked about in verse number three, in relation with the body at the time of the course, right? That the Buddha dedicated uh, many aspects. With compassion, I completely gave up uh, for them, uh, for the sentient beings, right? So for them, I gave up for them in order to accumulate merit, in order to detach and to accumulate merit. So if you imagine, if you have compassion, and we know compassion is a substantial cause for bodhicitta, right? So then, and bodhicitta is, has the other aspiration of the reason that one wants to become a Buddha for the benefit of sentient beings. So if your cause aspiration is strong, you, your reason and aspiration also becomes stronger, right? The means the stronger your compassion is, the stronger the wish for enlightenment becomes, you know? So if the, the stronger the wish for enlightenment is, then you, you also want to do more in order to achieve enlightenment, you know, and then you engage in those activities of accumulation of merit and, and wisdom, right? So that's why a, a person who has compassion and has not realized emptiness yet, that person will do whatever is possible to get emptiness realized, right? And then it's very inspiring to, to see, uh, to read biographies like, like, the always weeping bodhisattva, for example, praised by the Buddha himself, right? During the previous Buddha, then the always weeping bodhisattva was working with so much effort just to receive one verse of the teachings, right? Also, the Buddha himself in previous lifetimes, if you saw what the Buddha did for the purpose of one verse, why? Because they moved out of this compassion and they see whatever hardships it takes, I need to accomplish this state of enlightenment, right? So for us, and particularly in modern times, it's, it's kind of things are almost spoon fed, right? At Buddhism, <laughs> and, and you engage in online courses, you have to be clear, be, be sure that the sound is okay, otherwise you have to cut and start over again because people might hear something, some plane coming over in the background or something like that. So you think sometimes like, come on, you know, in the West people, we are sometimes a bit too, <laughs> and then, oh, I can hear this on the side or, you know, this, this, there's no hardship involved at all, right? Then, then yeah, if you think about how we, I mean, for us, it's, it's still quite, the condition has always been quite amazing compared to what happened before but you know with Bogaya with his own teaching you said knee to knee and then the tea boys come by the monks running in the dust and then the dust goes all over <laughs> everywhere <laughs> you're, you're in your tea and everywhere but everybody is perfectly okay right it's kind of yeah but then yeah so that's sometimes this is a little bit of hardship uh, is probably needed one of my good friends in the monastery uh, uh, yeah so he did a lot of retreats you know and he said that in certain retreats, when there was a little bit of hardship, actually was much better for the mind. It's very interesting. When, there's, when things are too, too well organized and too luxurious, then the mind also gets a bit lazy. And, and, and <laughs> it's very, very interesting. But the, the retreats he did in places where there's a little bit of hardship involved, he said, was much more beneficial to get the feeling of the lambrim, right? So that's probably a little bit true. If there's a little bit of hardship involved, then it's more beneficial in the mind. I remember when we were in Jimé 
uh, monastery, you know, the, <laughs> we were just sitting on the concrete with our own uh, cushion being brought. You know, we use for sitting on for meals, we use for in debate, we use for any teaching. And then our tables were just a cardboard box we got from the shop. <laughs> very, very simple, right? But but yeah, and then squeezed together because the room was not that big. But it, it, it works. <laughs> yeah. So you can see, you know, sometimes it, it's good to think and especially read the biographies of, of the masters of the past and the, the previous lifetimes of the Buddha or, or the always weeping Bodhisattva. You know, a Buddha, for example, if you read the 8,000 verses, which is also translated into English, I think, the 8,000 verses of, of the, it's probably one of the 84,000 projects being translated but towards the end of, of the of the of, the, of that particular sutra the 80,000 sorry the 8000 verses of the prachiparamita then the buddha actually praises this always weeping bodhisattva for his incredible hardship and effort yeah sometimes you can read even in the diamond kata sutra you can read how much hardship the buddha went through in previous lifetimes that he was falsely accused by a king of of, of adultery and then you know, he was cut, his limbs were cut or something like that. And then he said, oh, I didn't generate anger. You know, it's very interesting because he was contemplating emptiness at that time. Yeah, of course, it's for very advanced levels of practitioners, but you can see that, that is in relation with this particular verse that if you really have strong compassion and you have this, this oh, and then bodhicitta, right? Then whatever it takes to become a Buddha, you will do whatever is, is needed, right? So that's, very inspiring to to see that if that mind is so powerful and then it says here then you can give away wife sons wealth kingdom flesh blood body you know eyes bodies whatever you know so you for us <laughs> don't don't put it into practice now because that's only for for like aria bodhisattvas right but if you on that level then you can give up these things like giving away cooked vegetables as they say right so is, is that we have to know that context, right? Yeah. And then you give it all away for the purpose of accumulation of merit. Why do you need merit in order to, for your realization of emptiness, to eliminate the next level of obscurations, right? If you study grounds and paths, uh, for example, then you know how you proceed in the stage of the path to enlightenment. What do you have to accomplish? Yeah. And then you have to have the two things accumulation of merit and accumulation of wisdom. So accumulation of merit can be by teaching, by 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 or by just giving advice to people, help others to develop, right? And then you have to meditate on emptiness because without emptiness, you will never be able to eliminate obscurations. You know, if you see Lama Tsongkhapa, for example, towards the end of his life, during the day he was teaching, right, and in the evening he was just abiding in the non-duality of bliss and emptiness in order to eliminate these obscurations, right? So this kind of accumulation of merit. And, and wisdom both are very very essential yeah so he and the buddha sakyamuni he he practiced and that's very it's a very aspirational that the buddha practiced the sutra part all the way up to the ten bumi right yeah so uh, be very fortunate for those who have met the vajrayana but the buddha practiced the sutra system all the way up to the to the ten bodhisattva uh, Bumi, right? So it's very inspirational, and as Holmes always says, it's very important to read these aspects of 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 of, of the Buddha's life, and and especially there's this statue, His Holiness then put also in the temple in Namgyal of of uh, from from the on one museum in Pakistan, you know, where the Buddha of the six years austerity, you know, that 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 you can see the hardship the Buddha went through. So as Holiness says, sometimes it's important to to look at the hardships in order to see that our own little goggly goo problems in life actually are peanuts right so we think oh or problems with the center here and there or think oh difficult oh difficult oh it's also difficult maybe just give it all up <laughs> right <laughs> but you know it's kind of peanuts compared to what the buddha did you know and not just one lifetime but lifetimes so it's kind of uh, very good to get it yeah to take that as a teaching you know yeah Okay, then verse number six, it says, hence, if you benefit sentient beings, that is the best offering. Yeah, so because the Buddha wants all sentient beings to become enlightened, right? And if we walk in that direction, then, um, yeah, that's the only thing the Buddha wants us to do. 
if you harm sentient beings, there's the worst of harming me, you know? Yeah, because the only thing the Buddha wants is all sentient beings abiding in happiness and be separated from suffering. If we go against that, then then the Buddha said, uh-uh, that's, you know, that's harming me, actually, because the Buddha wants all sentient beings to be happy, and then you create an obstacle towards that, right? Yeah, it's very logical, you know? Yeah. So if you want to help the Buddhas, then you don't harm others, right? Yeah. Or if you want to help His Holiness, then you don't harm others. Since I and sentient beings experience happiness and suffering equally, yeah, that doesn't mean that the Buddha has an, 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 an an aspect of suffering anymore because you know the Buddha has uh, achieved nirvana and well non-abiding nirvana as we call it you know so that means that the Buddha doesn't have any form of suffering anymore you know but here the Buddha wants all sentient beings to be free of suffering so in that context it talks about I feel the same yeah because you go against the wish of that wish to be free of suffering in the mind of the Buddha right yeah, so the wish to be free of suffering is a relation with sentient beings, right? Okay. Since I and all sentient beings experience happiness and suffering equally, yeah, so that, yeah, that means in the context of the minds of sentient beings, how the Buddha sees that, and the Buddha has the same wish for sentient beings to be free of suffering and abide in happiness. So if you go against that, that harms the Buddha, right? And not directly harms the Buddha, but it harms the the in, the the accomplishment of the Buddha, basically. Because the Buddha wants to accomplish all sentient beings to be free of suffering, and you harm another person, you prevent that accomplishment from coming into being, right? So you can read it maybe in that kind of context, you know? Uh, go this one. Yeah. Since I and sentient beings experience happiness and suffering equally, how can you be my disciple when you harm sentient beings? Yeah, or can you be my follower? When you harm sentient beings, because similar as we talked about uh, the the the, the advice of taking refuge in the Dharma, right? Is is what has to be abandoned is you know not to harm sentient beings. Yeah, so that's exactly very clear in the in the advice after having taken refuge. Yeah, by depending on sentient beings, yeah. So depending on on, on sentient beings, you call you you please the Buddhas and cultivate virtue. Yeah, by depending on sentient beings, we we able to practice morality, we able to practice patience, you know, because without sentient beings, how can you practice patience? You know, this this uh, kaza, this uh, yeah, in the kadam tradition, um, then there are yeah, the, this kind of kadamba masters who walk around and pinpoint people and check people out. You know, like this meditator saying, oh, oh and then uh, this kadamba person came by and said what are you doing all the time and then the meditator says i'm meditating oh why are you meditating upon and they said i'm meditating on patience what you <laughs> he said a few things and then the meditator became angry right so they always go and check people out if they're doing the right correct correct ways of of, of, of practice you know and you know that story about don tompa to the person yeah okay you prostrate okay good or oh, you so come at late okay good or oh, you read scripture okay good or oh, you meditate you're good but back to better practice the dharma right you know that story so that's kind of in relation with this particular point yeah um yeah so for by depending on sentient beings that means by depending on sentient beings we can practice patience you know without sentient beings how can you practice patience you know without sentient beings how can you practice morality it's not possible, you know. So, without sentient beings, there's no compassion. Without sentient beings, there's no bodhicitta. That's what it says here exactly. You know? So, for the sake of sentient beings, you achieve, um, yeah, well, abiding perfections. All the perfections they depend on sentient beings, right? Yeah. So, uh, morality, you know. So, first of all, generosity, right? Generosity depends on others. Without others, I cannot practice generosity. And then, of course, uh, morality. Uh, is is an important aspect, you know. Patience, of course, and effort as well, you know. That that by that's that's effort as well. Why effort as well? Because if you, for example, study uh, effort in uh, Lama Tsongkhapa's Great Exposition, yeah, the practice, uh, the kaza, the perfection of effort in Lama Tsongkhapa's uh, Great Exposition, then he has very interesting quotations from the Ratnavali, you know that. And the Ranavali has very interesting quotations based upon a sutra called Ludumi Sebado, um, 
learned in this sepado. There's a sutra of requested by a bodhisattva named by the inexhaustible intelligent one. It's kind of a free translation of his name. But there it also says that because sentient beings are vast, that's why bodhicitta is so vast. And because bodhicitta is so vast, that's why Buddhahood is so vast. Right? It, it talks about the, the purpose of bodhicitta and also the purpose of Buddhahood and also the possibility of accomplishing that. Because if you generate um, bodhicitta, right, then it proves the, the possibility of accomplishing enlightenment because of, of the vast aspect of the cause. If the cause is vast, then the result is vast. You know, so that's kind of important aspects of, of the training being explained in that chapter in relation with sentient beings. You know, so that's why effort also depends on sentient beings. And then because you need to become a Buddha, so you need you know, the union of karma abiding special insight. And that also shows the importance of karma abiding and, and the perfection of wisdom, right? Perfection of concentration, perfection of wisdom. Yeah. So for the sake of sentient beings, you achieve uh, well abiding perfections. Yeah. By striving for the sake of sentient beings, you overcome the power of mental demons. That's the same thing, right? If you generate strong compassion, then automatically um, afflictions will become less. You know? And, and then the, these what's called the, the mental demons will become less. Because if you st generate strong compassion, then you, you, you practice the exchanging self for other methods as well, right? If you practice exchange self for other methods, then you eliminate the self-grasping attitude and the self-cherishing attitude. If you eliminate the self-cherishing attitude, then you eliminate the love of suffering because all our afflictions are rooted with and related with the self-cherishing attitude. So if, if you get rid of the self-cherishing attitude, you get rid of these afflictions. You know, so that's kind of uh, why it says here that by the power of, of generating more compassion, you overcome mental demons or, or the inner enemy, so to say, or the afflictions. Yeah? Practice towards sentient beings in such and such way, thus become a Buddha. Yeah? So by putting things into practice motivated with compassion and, 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 and bodhicitta, you move towards Buddhahood, and then you really be able to help others uh, to accomplish the purpose, because then you accomplish the purpose of others, right? You accomplish the Buddha, the bodies of a Buddha, the enjoyment body for those who are Arya Bodhisattvas, you can lead them, and then the emanation body for those who are not Arya Bodhisattva, like us, you know, to, to lead them to further uh, levels of realization. There are no beings, in verse number 8, there are no beings who are not family like this mother. So yeah, that refers to the, the cause and effect methods of bodhicitta, right? And you want to see all sentient beings as your mother or your father or those who are um, who helped you. Yeah. So that, that method we use has been very clearly explained in, in the Lamarri Gemma, for example, right, in the Great Exposition, there's a very important structure there that, that is needed to meditate in a particular structure, as Lama Sukapa indicates, that in order to generate compassion, which is a substantial cause for bodhicitta to arise, you have to get close to sentient beings, right? To get close to sentient beings, you have love and kindness. In Tibetan, we say, yi do ongwa jamba. Yi ong, yi do ongwa means uh, close to the mind or, or uh, appearing pleasurable as, as pleasurable to the mind. Yeah? So that close or pleasure feeling with sentient beings, the closer and the more you like sentient beings, the easier it will become to generate a wish for them to abide in, hap in happiness. Right. So that means that the love and kindness is, is kind of a preliminary in that particular practice, a preliminary to generating um, kasa, great compassion. Right, so the closer you are to sentient beings, then uh, the, the stronger your compassion becomes. So, and that's exactly why that man, that method is built upon that. That first you have to get close. So in order to get close, you think about others being very close to you, like your mother or your father or or, or, or somebody who took care of you, right? And then you you reflect upon the kindness, you repay the kindness, you become close, and then this yido on one jamba comes or this this appearing pleasant to the mind comes. When appearing pleasant to the mind comes, you want to do something for that person, right? So 
that if you have all sentient beings feeling close to you, it's much easier to generate compassion for all beings, you know? Yeah. And that, but that's, that particular method is structured in that way, you know? So in, in relation with the first line here in verse number eight, it says there are no sentient beings who are not fam family like this, like your own mother or father or people who took care, from whom you do not have strong affection uh, from this uh, life to life, yeah, from life to life. Yeah, so over lifetimes, we have depended on the kindness of others countless times. So it's time to repay that kindness. And then the close feeling comes, and then love and kindness become stronger, and then compassion becomes stronger. The, the stronger the beings are to you, the closer the feeling is, the stronger the compassion becomes, right? Yeah, so that's kind of um, the, the, how the technique is structured. Yeah. Though compassion and love for those beings, the goal will certainly be accomplished. Uh, equanimity and joy and so forth for the subject things sentient beings and impatient and so forth yeah so here it talks about uh, the four immeasurables right it talks about uh, compassion in the second line compassion and love right and the third line it talks about equanimity and joy yeah? so yeah so within the four within the four measurables you know love is the wish for sentient being pre to always abide in happiness. Compassion is the wish for others to um, uh, be separated from suffering. Equanimity is to let them abide in equanimity, free from the extremes of uh, attachment and, and, and aversion, right? And joy is, is kind of the equanimity of all sentient beings abide in, in higher rebirths and liberation. Yeah? So if you combine, for example, the, the four immeasurables, that's very interesting techniques actually, and certain hidden texts, they're not very well, yeah, they always been kept hidden for a long period of time, as you know, many of the mind trainings have been kept secret, you know, in the early days. There are still certain instructions called sealed instructions. They're quite been kept secret for a long period of time as well. One very inspiring one, uh, which talks about to do Tonglen in relation with the four immeasurables. It's a very powerful practice, actually, that you start with equanimity, yeah, you see all sentient beings as equal. Then you 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 put in the six cause and effect method partly. So you first do equanimity. Then you think them as your mother or father or whatsoever. Then you remember the kindness. Then you wish to repay the kindness. And then you go straight into a kind of compassion, right? You go straight into compassion as part of the Tonglen. Yeah, so you take away the suffering. And then you go into love and kindness of giving away your own happiness to them, right? And then you do the visualization of Tonglen. You take the suffering and the cause of suffering, and then you give away your happiness. And then you go to the to the joy aspect that they progress through your visualizations. You imagine that you take away their suffering and they abide every happiness, but also they proceed on the stages of the path to higher rebirth and liberation. Right, so you you imagine that happening when you do your visualization of Tonglen, and then you you did those four limbs, sorry, those four aspects of the four uh, immeasurables, and then you stop, and you say, this was just a vision. So you stop in the sense you took away the suffering, you give your own happiness to them, and then you imagine they accomplish the realizations of liberation and enlightenment. You imagine that all happened, that all sentient beings, by the power of your visualization, have accomplished liberation and enlightenment, right? And then you come to, because you have to come to bodhicitta, right? Tonglen is meant for the purpose of enhancing love and kindness and compassion, right? So then you did this visualization, you think in your visualization, you took all the suffering away, you give all your happiness, and they completely progressed on the stage of part of enlightenment. And then you think, this was just a visualization. I really have to do something. And then you engage in taking bodhisattva vows, for example, or you engage in your Vajrayana practices. Then it becomes a very sophisticated motivation because you, you tried and you see the need for others to be free of suffering and you see the need for others to develop. So you did that completely in a visualization. And then you say, now I have to do really something constructive. Constructive. I really have to generate bodhicitta. I really have to get realizations of the part. And then you engage with that motivation 
in starting with your six session guru yoga for example or, or you know in a six session guru yoga the structure is very similar right for those who do you take refuge then you do the four measurables then you do aspirational and engaging bodhicitta right so this technique is very powerful in the sense of contemplating the four immeasurables in relation with Tong Len, and then come to this final conclusion, and then see it's just a visualization, and then take the Bodhisattva vows, right? So that brings you in a constructive kind of subst creating substantial causes for enlightenment, you know, because you see the need. Yeah. So that's in relation with the four, noble, four immeasurables, in relation with this, what is mentioned in verse number eight. Yeah. Meditate for a long time on patience. Yeah, so that's uh, throughout many texts, uh, practice of patience is very important because otherwise it's two steps, uh, kaza, two steps ahead and three steps backward. If you generate anger again and again, then uh, yeah, it destroys, right, positive potentials. I don't know, yeah, I, in certain talks I talked already about one of my friends, we went to this mirror lady in, 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 um, in Bale Cooper, this very old lady, she was in the 80s. Even Lama Zoparim, she went to her a few times. She's right. She was very good. She passed away a few years ago. But I went with one of my friends. <laughs> and he was also a monk. I never asked about previous lifetimes because, you know, uh, what's the point? It's more important to look at the future. But he was interested. And then he asked about his previous lifetime. And then she said, <laughs> very interesting. She said, oh, you were, you were a meditator, but you were not very successful because you were quite uptight. <laughs> it's about, I thought, oh, that's a quite interesting kind of comment because it's true, right? If, if there's too much anger, then we, we, we destroy what we just accomplished. Yeah, so that's kind of why practicing patience is so important, you know? And as Holiness tells the monks and nuns, when you do pujas for the lay community or these kind of practices, and some, you know, the traditional lay community, they like the drums and, you know, all the kind of equipment we have when we do put out <laughs> the bells and the drums. So then as only said, you know, you do a little bit of that and then you sit down and then you contemplate the practice of patience, Shantideva. You read Shantideva's chapter on patience, you just recite it in the puja and then you just contemplate it. And then in the end, you do the drum again, you know, <laughs> so that that puts an emphasis that as only says, then everybody benefits. The people there benefit because you do some good praise based on a good motivation with the Bodhisattva Chara Advara. And the practitioners or the people who do the puja, they also had an opportunity to contemplate patience, right? Yeah. That's getting a bit dark. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's kind of an aspect of what is very important for us to uh, contemplate again and again, practice of patience. Yeah. So it says in the last line meditate for a long time on patience. Uh, with a mind of strong effort. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, because of the motivation of compassion. Yeah. Okay, so then we go to verse number nine. And there it says, I have given many migrating beings, uh, things such as elephants and so forth. Yeah, this practicing generosity. Yeah, the Buddha in his previous lifetime, following the sutra system of, 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 of the Bodhisattva Yana for the accumulation of merits, you know, had to practice generosity. Yeah? That's the easiest way to accumulate merit. Yeah? For sentient beings to become suitable vessels. And that's, uh, yeah, that's another way to practice generosity. One way is for the purpose of accumulation of merit. And the other way is to benefit them in the sense on the long term. So short term benefit is giving the things they need, but then make a connection with them and make a prayer. And on the long term, you can benefit them in a, in a greater deal. Right? Yeah, so then you see uh, sometimes that, um, yeah, even great masters like Lama Zopa Rinpoche give presents to people to, to, to make a connection, you know? Uh, yeah, it's not really bribing, but <laughs> it's a very skillful way of bribing, you could say, <laughs> to, to please beings for their benefit. Because then later on, you can, uh, you know, you can take them to the next level. It's very interesting if you see, when, as we see that happening for the first time, you think, hmm? Why? But in the long term, there's so much benefit, right? Yeah. So once in Bangalore, when I was involved in developing a center, and then we went to family, and then Rimshi spent so much time with his family. I thought, why? You know, they're not really interested in Buddhism. Why is Rimshi spending so much time with his people? And two years later, we had to organize a public talk 
And this family was very, very helpful because they had very good connection with the police. <laughs> so it's not, it's not, maybe she already saw that coming. Yeah, right? So you can see these kind of masters, they plan in advance. You know, they, they, they spend some time with people now in, because in the future there might be, uh, for their benefits, good and for the overall project will be very helpful, you know. So that's also practicing generosity. Yeah, and you know, Lam Zobar sometimes practices generosity of, of giving his own body in the early days to, to, to mosquitoes, letting, taking, you know, uh, just mosquitoes came in Bogaya one day, you know, Grimshay took up all his dress and then put on the lights, open windows, and all mosquitoes came, you know, and then sitting there making prayer, you know. So that's that's the way, if you really think, that's the way to, to for those kind of highly realized beings to make a connection, right? Yeah, so that's kind of very inspiring to see, you know. Yeah, so the Buddhas did that countless time, or they show the aspect of a beggar. You know, if you're not a, if you really think, if you really think about, be clear about the precious human rebirth, right? And you think about there is no I or controller. Everything is dependent on cause and effect relationships, right? To have a mind with the interest in the Dharma is very difficult, very, very rare. Because it's very easy to have other habituation patterns in the mind, right? If you really think about it, in emptiness and with emptiness and combined with dependent origination, cause and effect relationships of states of mind that are influenced by previous moments of mind, then you know how incredible difficult it is to make a connection and keep that connection, right? So then you can imagine there are times and periods for people when there's no connection at all. So what do the Buddhas do at that time? They just emanate in the form of a beggar or something and give a person opportunity to give something and make a connection. They make a strong prayer. And then a few lifetimes down the line, there's not a meeting. Yeah, and we know that the Buddha himself gave his body to the, to the tigress with the five cups, right? And then they became the first five disciples, you see? So that's kind of how these beings, they think about long-term. Yeah, sometimes we don't know, especially when you go to pilgrimage places, then sometimes uh, the people there or the beggars there Sometimes very, very, you meet sometimes very interesting people, you know, they just there and then you never find them again anymore or very interesting sometimes, you know, so that's kind of, they act in a way to make connections with beings, you know, that's the only thing, you know, because they cannot teach straight away because there won't be interest from the side of the student, but then they let them make an, make an offering or something or give something to them. So that's exactly how to make a connection in relation with this particular verse. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, um, for sentient beings to be suitable vessels, not to get more students or something and become famous, but for their purpose, to develop their minds, to develop the minds of sentient beings. That's why they attracted them with, with generosity. You know? Yeah. It's true, right? It's, that's how it works. If, you, if I give you a present, you think, oh, that's nice of Namdak, right? And then <laughs> that's how it goes. It's this kind of how society works, you know? And so you get something, you think, oh, that's neither this person. And then the bodhisattvas do that for that purpose, right? To, to make a connection and then uh, move it to the next level, you know? Um, yeah, sentient beings uh, tortured by various problems or afflictions, yeah? Generate compassion for them uh, and to protect sentient beings. So for that purpose, yeah? If not to protect sentient beings, then for what purpose do I achieve the two purposes? Yeah, we just talked about the purpose of self and the purpose of others. That's reference to the four bodies of a Buddha, right? The two truth bodies, the wisdom truth body and the nature truth body is for the purpose of self. And the enjoyment body and the uh, animation body is for the purpose of others, right? So the two purposes, two bodies for the purpose of self and two bodies for the purpose of others. Yeah. Then verse number 10, uh, if there were no sentient beings uh, with karma and delusions, there would be no continuity of life in unbearable harms from the very many on the delusion of samsara. Yeah, so that's true. We, samsara is there because of sentient beings and because sentient beings have an affliction. So that has to go. Yeah? So the afflictions have to be dealt with or karma and afflictions has to be eliminated. Yeah? By depending on them, actual this benefit. Yeah? So by depending on suffering sentient beings, we become uh, 
a Buddha. And even the Bodhisattvas, they use afflictions into the part, right? As we know, if you study, for example, um, um, certain types of mind training in particular, the Wheel of Sharp Weapons talks about how Bodhisattvas use afflictions into the part. They're born by the power of prayer in dependence on karma and afflictions, not by the power of karma and afflictions. And so Arya Bodhisattvas, for example, they're born for the purpose of being born for sentient beings. So they need causes for rebirth, yeah, as, as separate from emanation bodies. And then they depend on previous created karma and afflictions to, to be reborn, right? So you need cause to be reborn, but not by the power in an uncontrolled way, by the power of karma and afflictions, but by depending on karma and afflictions. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So by depending on the actualized this bodhicitta, if I um, is this one gone to bliss, the very splendid one was ornament of cyclic existence, don't have affected for, uh, affection for sentient beings, then for whose sake alignment is achieved. Yeah? So that talks about the things again and again. Uh, for the purpose of sentient beings, the Buddha became enlightened and the, the enlightened, the bodies of the Buddha are also for the purpose of sentient beings, right? So the cause is for the purpose of sentient beings and the result is for the purpose of sentient beings. Yeah. Then the final large verse, number 11, for as long as this, my teachings benefiting sentient beings blazes for that uh, long, you wishing supreme benefit others, should remain yeah so that means uh, try to enhance this wish of bodhicitta again and again and then to studying i practice well and never felt discouraged you know that's very important you know um because sometimes you know we think it's all too difficult and ooh, ooh, yeah, difficult and you know and the mind gets a bit negative sometimes and then oh you know but <laughs> as i said before look at at what the 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 buddhas are are are, are done uh at the time of Bodhisattva for the benefit of all sentient beings, right? That's 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 mind-boggling. If you really read the stories in the in the sutras or or Jataka tales, for example, or the stories of the great masters of the tradition, it's very inspiring to see what they've done for the purpose of sentient beings and the Dharma. When I was a bit down, I mean down, uh, yeah, sometimes you get down, right? <laughs> in a monastery about <laughs> the difficulties sometimes and then you know, and then uh, involving various projects and doesn't go well and you put so much time and effort and then, ah, oh, there's not that much benefit and then why put so much time and effort in this? Maybe we should do something else. <laughs> you know, sometimes we get quite discouraged, you know. So then I was reading a biography uh, by uh, one of the Nyingma traditions, uh, Veruchana Lotsawa. Lotsawa Veruchana is also translated. His biography is translated, very inspiring because he went through so much hardship for the Dharma and sentient beings. And then he just carried on. <laughs> it was inspiring. Or Lama Zoparimisha told me at that time, he said, you know, quoting from, from the Sutra, of, of Shant, also from Shantideva and from the Lama Chirpa, right? In the Lama Chirpa, we have this, this verse on effort in the dedication prayer of the Lama Rim, where it says, even for uh, one sentient beings to generate uh, one moment of virtue uh, to go to the hell round, right? So then sometimes we think we do all these projects and... <sighs> You know, there's not really the 80-20 rule of business doesn't really apply, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so then you feel a bit kind of discouraged, but then you think, you know, uh, that's what Lama Zopra told me at that time also, you know, when I was involved in projects and didn't go well and so much time and effort, and he said, yeah, sometimes it, somebody suffers, you know, Namdak, he said that they just go to, to various difficult states of existence just for one being to generate one moment of virtue in the mind. So it's true, right? Sometimes we forget um, because we're very short-sighted. We see, we do the things and we, we give talks or, or we help people the best way we can in centers. And then we think, oh yeah, what's the benefit? And, but we don't see the bigger picture, right? That one teaching people attend or, or can have incredible benefits. You know, if you think about karma having the potential of increase, for example, or you think about these stories about Buddhas giving one teaching and then or this one activity with the, with, the, with the cups, right? And then they become the first disciples, right? So things can, if you really start a little bit of fate in cause and effect relationships, then you see, you can see the benefits a bit more, right? So that's quite important for us as an individual practitioner, as well as helping out in projects and centers. It's sometimes good to know that although it looks very small, but on the bigger picture, 
it's, it's, it's much bigger than we initially think, you know. And of course, the more obstacles we face, then um, the less obstacles in the future, right? It's kind of purification as well, you know. And you know how to deal with obstacles. If you know how to deal with obstacles, then whatever you face in the future is not really an obstacle anymore, right? So that's not a good thing to 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 think about, you know. Yeah. For as long as this may my teachings benefit sentient beings, so that's kind of um, a kind of dedication, right? Blazes for that long, you wishing supreme benefit others should remain through studying, yeah, and practice. So study and practice, yeah, it's not two different things, right? Because studying is practice in one way. I practice well and never felt discouraged for the sake of sentient beings. Study likewise. So do the same, you know, without grief, extract the essence from this body. Yeah. So meaning taking the essence out of this precious human rebirth, which is so rare to be found and, and easy lost and has great meaning, right? Uh, and great meaning on a temporary and ultimate means uh, uh, based on the present vessel we have, we can achieve high rebirth liberation and enlightenment, yeah? So that is quite, uh, and then also every moment we can create causes for that, yeah? So that's kind of the kind of last encouraging advice uh, Nagarjuna shares with us. Yeah, so it's a very short text, but yeah, it's a very nice text. Uh, Geshe, Geshe Tuga, you know, where, where, this, where we use the translation of Kurukula Center. He requested also His Holiness to give, uh, once I think, Tashi Lumpo. Yeah. But then, unfortunately, Gana passed away, uh, I think, a few years before that. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very nice, it's a very short summary of, of important aspects of, of, of uh, praising sentient beings. Uh, but yeah, it's, I find it very helpful for the mind. And, and many of those short texts, Ari Nagarjuna, are are short but very profound. You know, it's, it's great, great meaning. So I hope there was some benefit in, in talking about this a little bit. And then, yeah, we eight minutes over time. But yeah, what to do? That's how it is sometimes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's not too bad. Sometimes I go much more over time. So if there's any questions, we we can still uh, see if there's an answer. Otherwise, um, yeah, we can then again. Yeah, Avalado. Yeah. Hi, Gisela. Thank you Hi. so much. It's precious teaching. Yeah. Um, uh, you mentioned earlier uh, that uh, from the Chitta Matra point of view, one sees uh, uh, relates to two phenomena as projections of the mind. Mm -hmm. And how do you relate that to the Prasangika uh, 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 reality and knowing? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's very similar in the sense that. Things appear as, as as separate from consciousness, right? But the, the, there's a there's a, one aspect is is very similar because in the in the prasangika we say things appear inherent without dependence, meaning without dependence on consciousness, without depending on our objects, right? So in that op, in that from that point of view, appearing without without dependence is definitely there. But there are differences because in the mind only we say things appear distant and cut off from consciousness, right? And they say in the mind only what appears to your mind, right? And the mind to which it appears, those two are simultaneous. Those two are simultaneous because they mm -hmm. arise by the power of one potential in your mind mm -hmm. of having seen something similar or having thought about something like that or verbalized something like that as various seeds. And so by mm -hmm. one of those seeds coming to ripening, things appear to your consciousness, right? Mm -hmm. So that's different from Prasangika. The Prasangika says, of course, whatever appears to you, inherent, depends on previous imprints of seeing things inherently, right? Mm -hmm. So that aspect is, is similar. But that the object that appears to your mind and the mind itself are simultaneous, that's not the same. Because in the mind only, they say that it's simultaneous, well, in the Prasangika, we say it's not simultaneous. There's an object that creates our consciousness to arise. So in the Prasangika, in that op in, from that point of view, is the same as in the Sutra school or in the Sautantika, that the object of your eye consciousness, for example, produces the eye consciousness, right? Meaning that the object, there's a cause and effect relationship between the object and your eye consciousness perceiving that object. Yeah, so that's also mm -hmm. the Prasangika. Um, holds that in that way. But the Prasanga doesn't say that object appears from its own side, right? Prasanga said the object appears 
from its own child, but that's not how it exists. And the way it appears also is depending on previous imprints of inherent existence. Yeah, so you can mm -hmm. see certain aspects are similar, but there are differences. You see that a little yeah. bit? Yeah, I, I guess from a practical point of view, uh, the um, uh, Chitta Matra uh, perspective is very helpful uh, uh, mm -hmm. for one. Um, um, ultimately, whatever one's uh, ontological beliefs might be, uh, mm -hmm. what comes down in, in the practice and da daily life uh, is what's meaningful. So both traditions can be worked from to together. Yeah, right? true, very true, yeah. Because, because that's if you study in a traditional way, for example, as we did in the monastery, for example, then when we study mind only, you defend the mind only school in debate. Right, so you study the mind only and you try to really go into that view and you try to defend it when somebody else debates you. Although you know the prasangika is, is kind of an ultimate view, but at that time you just only debate from within the mind only. So you start to understand mind only a bit better, you know, and that's a very, in one way, it's a very profound view, right? And very helpful when it comes to, to external appearances and how imprints create appearances. It's very interesting. But yeah, if you see these subtle differences, then you see also how the different schools actually talk about similar things, but subtle aspects are slightly different, you know? And that's very helpful. Yeah. yeah. And also what, what you were talking about, mentioning uh, quantum physics, uh, mm -hmm. the role of in, in creating at the quantum level, yeah. uh, the emergence of, 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 yeah. of, of beingness, of matter is, yeah. is, is crucial, so yeah. Yeah, and actually when I was in Oxford, uh, uh, two weeks ago, uh, then also I give a presentation on on, uh, on Buddhist uh, philosophy, and then I made a correlation between Buddhist philosophy and quantum mechanics, right? So in quantum mechanics, we have cubism as one interpretation that the the the, the mind or the, ob or the observer influence what's been observed, right? So that's very similar to the mind only, you know. Yeah. And, and then Bohm's interpretation is, is very similar to the autonomy school, the Svatantrika school, for example, right? And then Carlo Rovelli's interpretation is almost the same as, as the Prasangika, right? So I made a kind of uh, chart and then related and explained a little bit in that context. But yeah, it, you see, there's a, there's a very interesting correlation between, and then the Newtonism is, is the, the, the view from Newton is more according to Vabasika and Svatantrika, right? So it's very interesting to correlate actually the, 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 the four schools of Buddhist philosophy with the, the, yeah, the views in, in physics, right? Yeah, it's very interesting, yeah. Okay. Is that, was that talk recorded? No, because Oxford University is quite strict with, with uh, you know, they have their own protocols and, and uh, yeah, no, there was only four course for those who attended at that time. It was a hybrid course, but yeah. Yeah, and the, their courses are not cheap. <laughs> Yeah. Well, maybe Shanti, uh, Shanti Deva will, will sponsor you to give us a, a talk on that. It sounds yeah. fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I, yeah, hi. I, I was, hello. I wasn't, I still am not clear about um, the comment you made about bodhisattvas take rebirth independence on karma and I, afflictions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I would think at that point they don't have karma and afflictions in their mental. No, no. I mean, like Arya Bodhisattvas on on the on the first uh, and and up to including the seventh ground, they're not liberated yet, right? According to the Prasangika view of of, of the grounds and parts, on on the eight, nine, and ten grounds, they are being liberated from samsara. But until then, they're not liberated from samsara. Right, so they still take rebirth, and the best way to take rebirth is for the benefit of others. And then they not take rebirth by the power of karma and afflictions, but by depending on karma and afflictions, because they're born by the power of prayer. Yeah, so there's a difference. We are born by the power of karma and afflictions, and they by the power of, of prayer. Yeah, they, but they depend on karma and affliction because they still, they don't create new karma anymore. There's no, no 12 links anymore they create, but they still have 12 links created before they became an Arya Bodhisattva, right? So they use that karma actually to be born somewhere. Like, you know, they check, okay, if I, because you have to plan, right? 
<laughs> and you know your future father and mother have to meet and they have to have the right cause and conditions all present so they they plan those things and they still need a substantial cause right nothing is beyond karma and afflictions oh, sorry nothing is beyond the cause and effect i should say nothing is is an exception to the cause and effect so in order to be born in a particular place where it's beneficial they need the causes for that right so they use a course created in the past in a very skillful way and then they're not overpowered by affliction, but they use it for the purpose of, of, of these kind of rebirths to benefit beings, right? Very interesting, yeah. Thank you, Geshe And the other thing I wanted to, that I'm very confused about still mm -hmm. is for, for um, Arya Bodhisattvas on the eighth stage where mm -hmm. they have eliminated all the afflictive obscurations, mm -hmm. I've, always, I've often wondered why for those beings that realization of emptiness doesn't generate great compassion. Like, you know, why we also have the tradition of generating bodhicitta. Hmm. Do you understand what I'm, where I'm going with? Why, why the, the, the pure ground bodhisattvas? You know, when they have that realization of, of emptiness, yeah. um, why that realization of emptiness in and of itself doesn't produce the great compassion to help all beings. Like, why do we need Ale. to have, you know, bodhicitta, you know, as that motivation, as something separately that we have to generate and develop in our mind streams? Why doesn't the understanding of emptiness in and of itself for those beings on the eighth level make them want to help everyone? I think it will. I mean, generally speaking, it's kind of the initial to initial generate a realization of bodhicitta, right? Then, then the realization of emptiness helps, right? Or the, 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 the realization of emptiness makes compassion stronger. And that's why it's easier to develop bodhicitta. And that pro it's been proven that the majority of the bodhisattvas realize emptiness before realizing bodhicitta. But then when bodhicitta is being generated, then, you know, and especially if you have a direct perception of emptiness, then the bodhicitta is, is, so, is, is so strong that it's, it's not the same level as, as for us when we have to develop it, that emptiness will increase it, right? Because that level is much, is always, the, the bodhicitta is already realization, right? Yeah, so I for a beginning, yeah? Sorry, the, sorry, please, Kesha. Yeah, no, no, was, is that what you're asking for or no? It sort of, because I also, often wonder like you know we say our hearts are like eight stage bodhisattvas mm -hmm. but our hearts don't have you know have not generated bodhicitta but yeah, you know yeah. if, they, if they're having the same realization of emptiness ah, I yeah, yeah. wonder like why that in itself because there's no sense of self there's an understanding yeah, of yeah, 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 yeah. yeah but but they didn't generate great compassion before their realization of emptiness right that's the difference they have compassion Right, so among the four immeasurables, there is the compassion of 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 a traditional speaking of how wonderful be if beings were free of suffering, may they be free of suffering, right? But I will cause them to be free of suffering, without exception. That's not really there. But even people within the the the, the those parts who want to become an arat, you can see exactly the same reason that if you have the realization of, of reality of emptiness, compassion will increase. For example, this video I often tell people about in, in talks is, is this video by Ma Boa, one of the great masters of the forest tradition of Thailand. Yeah, so he was a direct disciple of Acharya Moon. It's a very inspiring biography. So he has one, there's one video of Ma Boa where he talks about his realization of selflessness or his realization of the clarity of the mind. And then combined with, because he has calm abiding, combined with his clairvoyance of seeing lifetimes of beings being born in various states, he generated so much compassion. That's very interesting, actually, to see the correlation with his clairvoyance as well as his realization of, of, of emptiness, right? And then seeing sentient beings suffering and see the correlation why beings are suffering. And then generates compassion because he starts crying in the middle of, 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 of the talk. 
And you can see it's, it's a general form, right? So that means that this insight is, is, is throughout all traditions, probably the same thing, but the, the, the compassion we talk about is, is all sentient beings without exception. And there in, in certain countries like, like Thailand and Sri Lanka, you can see even people don't believe they can become a Buddha. That's just a part of their tradition. It's only meant for certain individuals. So they don't put much emphasis on bodhicitta because of that aspect, right? But the, yeah, uh, compassion is definitely there. But that means if you have bodhicitta from the beginning, and then you enhance your realization of selflessness, you go a different track. You see that, right? Because then the, 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 they enhance each other all the way up. Yeah, but if you initially just merely inspire by initiation and then realize, realize selflessness, then it doesn't really enhance the compassion because you don't really contemplate that again and again and again. This might be one of the reasons, yeah. Yeah, so that's why for an Arat, to, to then there is compassion that increases, but then it, maybe not the compassion that is the compassion of, of taking the responsibility, so to say, right? Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's maybe why there is a difference in that way. But that emptiness increases compassion in both traditions that we can see from this example of Mahaboa, for example, very inspiring example, actually, yeah. I have to think about it some more, Geshe-la. I don't know, I yeah. somehow get stuck at this idea that you know, if you truly have that understanding of selflessness and interdependence, you just should care about everyone yeah. and try to help them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's Thank true you. in one way. It's true, but but then, yeah, that's if you if you really are convinced that it's not possible to help everybody, then you just want to get out of it, right? Because you you have this 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 strong renunciation. Right? So that's another kind of way to look at it, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, excuse me. Hello, right. Gishela. Hello. Uh, listen, uh, but uh, the non-self and uh, realization of happiness is not the same thing. I mean, Prateka Buddha and Shravakas, yeah. they, they realize the non-self, but not the voidness of every phenomena in the universe. No, mm. I think, but maybe I'm wrong. So mm. I don't know. My it question depends. is, yeah, yeah. Please. It depends which school of, of Buddhist philosophy you you explain it, right? According to the Svatantrika uh, or the Yogacarya Madhyamaka, yeah, yeah, the main school of, of Buddhist philosophy we use in general to to explain the grounds and paths, then they say in order to get liberated, you only realize the selves of a person and well, the self-sufficient substantial existing self, right? Yeah, yeah, but yeah, according yeah. to the Prasangika, you have to realize the selflessness of person as well as phenomena and in phenomena. order to get liberated. Yeah, because the root of samsara is twofold, right? In the Prasangika, meaning the self of a person and the self of phenomena. And that's one of the features of the Prasangika school among the eight uncommon points is that even for liberation, you have to realize the emptiness of inherent existence of persons and phenomena, right? So that's kind of a an, an presentation within Prasangika, but often the presentations in the Yogacarya Madhyamaka school, then we only talk about the selflessness of a person for liberation, right? But in the Prasangika, it's, it's, it indicates, you know, that the root of samsara is twofold. Self a person, self phenomena, you have to realize the emptiness of, of, of both in order to get liberated. Yeah. So even Shravaka and Pratika Buddha, then they have to have yeah. realized emptiness. Both. To the, yeah, true. Emptiness. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. But, but also, it's interesting to study um, the other traditions within their, within their field, you know, because sometimes in our to be honest, I study our tradition quite for quite some years, but you know, I can see that in our classical tenets, the way we present sometimes the, the, the Hinayana vehicle or, or, or you know, better term, the, the, the Prachekayana vehicle or the Sravakayana vehicle, it's, you know, to be honest, that it's not always exactly as we sometimes say, that's kind of the, 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 the South Trantrika and the Vabasika view, right? Because if you read Marcy Saida's, uh, you know, Manual of Special Insight, for example, it's very similar to Prasangika, right? 
Yeah. So that's, that's, that's also true for the Hindu philosophy, the way we present Hindu philosophy in our schools of tenets. If you talk with, if I talk with my friends in India, who were well versed in certain philosophies of the Samkhya, it's quite different, you know. So it's good also to study the, the traditions within the tradition rather than how we present them, right? Yeah. But yeah, put that aside, and even in our own tradition, we say, uh, in the, yeah, all beings for liberation have to realize according to the view of Prasangika, right? If you present it from within the Prasangika school. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, Thank you. I have a question uh, following up with Sinead's about uh, taking rebirth uh, through skillful utilization of past karma for um, yeah. what half was before the eighth uh, ground. Um, how does that relate to the the bodies that uh, bodhisattvas can manifest? Yeah, yeah. good yeah. question. Yeah, it's true. They, you know, on the first ground, there's 100 emanation bodies, right? And on the second, there is, there's uh, yeah, 10 times that. So it, it multiplies, right? So that's also true. But also the continuity itself of the continuity of consciousness. You can have an emanation body. You can sit in meditation and emanate something, right? That's one aspect. Yeah. Or you can show an emanation as a form of a rebirth. But still, the continuity is still, it still has previous karma, right? And it's not achieved liberation yet. Yeah, so there's still a need for that continuity with which has various bodies, but it still needs, you know, it still has the karma is is, is still there of, of dying and being reborn, you know. So to use that aspect of the continuity, then they make these prayers and then they depend on the previous karma to be reborn. But at the same time, they have various emanations according to the different levels of the boomies. You no, know? it's probably like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, Welcome. Yeah. Sorry, I just said maybe just one quick yeah, question. One yeah, sure. <laughs> I hope no very quick, but um, sorry, I just would love some clarification because um, you had mentioned that from the Prasangika point of view, you need the um, uh, selflessness of self and phenomena in order to become liberated. Mm -hmm. But then could you kindly um, help explain how that relates to the Chittamatra and um, uh, uh, Madhyamika views of um, realization mm -hmm. of both self selflessness itself and phenomena yeah okay yeah. yeah so in in the prasangika is very clear in prasangika everybody who wants to be a sravaka arat or pracheka buddha or a full enlightened being needs to realize selflessness of phenomena as well as selflessness of persons everything being empty of inner existence very clear that's according to the prasangika view right then the yogacara uh, svatantika madhyamaka right yeah, the autonomy school, so they say. They say for liberation, you do not need to realize the selfness of phenomena. Only in order to become a Buddha, you need the realization of, of selfness of phenomena. Right? Then they also made a distinction between Sravaka and Pracheka. They say the Sravaka needs to realize the emptiness of a self sufficient substantial existing self. And then the, the, the Prachekas need to realize. The emptiness of duality, very similar to the mind only school. They really need to realize that that the, the the mind and its object are empty of a different substance, right? So they they because they called yogacharya, yeah, they called yogacharya mayamaka because they have follow aspect of the mind only, right? So they say for pracheka Buddha, you need to realize the emptiness more or less similar to the mind only. Yeah, for the Sravaka uh, Arat, you have to realize. The, the the self being empty of a self-sufficient substantial existing self and for buddhahood you have to realize the emptiness of true existence yeah that's according to the yoga school in the mind only they have very similar interpretations they say in the mind only they say in order to become an, a, an pracheka or a sravaka you have to realize the self of a self-sufficient substantial existing self yeah of a person for buddhahood you have to realize the emptiness of 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 duality or the emptiness of the mind and its object being empty of a different substance. Yeah, that's according to the mind only school. Yeah. Then according to the Sautrandrika and the Vibhasika school, they don't talk about enlightenment. They don't talk about selfness of phenomena because they don't believe in selfness of phenomena. They don't accept selfness of phenomena. While in the mind only you saw that in order to become a Buddha, you have to realize the selfness of phenomena, right? In the mind only being 
the, the mind and its object being empty of a different substance, right? But it's in their school, the, the, the selflessness of phenomena, right? So in, in, the, in the Sutra and Vabhasika schools, they don't talk about the, the, the selfness of phenomena because they said all phenomena exist from their own side, right? They don't say all phenomena have a self. Right? They only talk about selfness of person and they don't really talk about how to proceed to Buddhahood rather than in the very kind of um, co coarse way. And then they just talk about being empty of a self that is self-sufficient, substantially existing self, yeah, that has to be eliminated, right? So they say in order to get liberated or to become a Buddha, you have to realize the emptiness of a person who is empty of a self-sufficient, substantially existing self. That is according to the Satrantika and the Vibhasika in general. Then the Vibhasika has 18 sub-schools, and if you want to debate that, then maybe we can do that another time. <laughs> yeah. Because there's one sub-school who doesn't accept this or doesn't talk about this self-sufficient substantial and self. They only talk about the self that's empty of Takti uh, Karamachan, permanent, unitary, and independent, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's a very brief summary, actually, the, the four schools in. Yeah, how to get liberated and enlightenment. Yeah. Okay. All right. Then thank you so much for all your good work and, and study and, and practice and uh, all the things you're doing. So let's dedicate um, all this. So maybe we can just do, um, yeah, I just indicate and then you can just follow. And the main thing is, you know, the mind, right? Rather than reading. So I think we dedicate for the two bodhicittas, first of all, uh, to be generate all sentient beings. And uh, yeah, so let's first dedicate for those two purposes. Yeah. Janju Simjo Rimboche, Magye Panang Yuji, Geba Nyamba, Meba Yang, Gone Gonda Dawa, Tony Tawa Rimboche, Magye Panang Yuji, Geba Nyamba, Meba Yang, Gone Gonda Dawa. And also the spreading of the Buddha Dhamma in all directions. Yes, as we read in the text, for the benefit of beings and, and, and the teachings, right? So that's also important to generate for the spreading of the Buddha Dhamma in all directions. Yeah. Dagi Jine Sabha Gewa Di Tendan Joa Gindan Dham Gewa Jason Lozan Trapa Yi Tembe Nimbo Rindu Seljo Shaw. And also for all uh, precious gurus, in particular, His Holiness Dai Lama, Lama Zobarim She, and all the teachers, teaching through part to enlightenment, have a long and healthy life, and all the holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. Kare Rawe Korwe Singam So Tendan Dewa Malu Jongwe. Chere Zegwan Tenzin Gyaso Yi Shape Zite Badu Ten. And then to conclude, for oneself and all sentient beings in every part of precious gurus, and quickly progress on the stages of part to enlightenment uh, in all future lifetimes. And then while making this final dedication, thank yourself, making dedication and dedication and the aim we dedicate to its two empty of inner existence and the nature of dependent origination. And that's why our dedications actually become true, right? Sealing it with uh, bodhicitta and with uh, emptiness, so to say. Yeah, so final dedication. Um Gewa Gunda Yanda Lama Dan Dame Chugi Pala Lobi Sadan Lamgi Yunda Ramsam Doji Changi Poba Nito Shaw. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, and see you another time, another place. Yes. Yeah. All the planet. <laughs> Thank you, Geshe Law. It's really wonderful teaching, very inspiring and motivating. And we yeah. hope to invite you. You will come back. Please come yeah. back and teach again here. Sure. Yeah, let's see. I have to make a schedule up for next year still a bit. So let's see if we can fit it in somewhere. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Geshe so Law. Thank you, Geshe Law. Thank you for taking day. all our questions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Have a good day. Rest you too. today in the US. Good evening. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you.